Welcome to the Cheating Secrets channel. The best part of going to my wife's corporate party was getting the chance to drive my Challenger. The worst part was that the faster I drove, the quicker I got there. The party was being held at the company's lodge, and there was a smooth 30-kilometer stretch of road leading to it. No stop signs, no traffic lights, no jams. Just an open road, waiting for the Challenger to do its thing. It also meant no gas stations or stores along the way. Donna and I had been drifting apart since both our daughters got married. I had hoped for the opposite, but it wasn't meant to be. Donna insisted I accompany her to this event, even though I made it clear I didn't want to go. She usually went to these things alone. Donna enjoyed drinking, and I didn't. I sometimes had a beer. She was a social butterfly, and I wasn't. Over the past year, I had suspected she was having an affair. At that point, I didn't really care. I think that was one of the reasons we were growing distant. I was just waiting for the right moment, looking for a way out of this uncomfortable relationship. I needed a way to end our marriage. I have to admit that I might be the reason my wife decided to look for greener pastures. You could say I'm a bit of an eccentric minimalist. I grew up in a very poor family. My brothers and I had far less than most kids our age, and by that, I mean things like bicycles, toys, pets, trendy electronic gadgets, and the like. It was almost like being Amish without the religion. I wasn't ignorant, and I fully understood how the normal world worked, but I couldn't bring myself to agree with it. I knew it was important to stay out of debt, to pay your bills, and to set something aside for retirement. To live a comfortable minimalist life, you don't have to be a fanatic, but you do need self-control. Allowing yourself a few indulgences can make you seem more normal to most people. My biggest weakness was my marriage and family. It was really hard for me to find a woman who, I felt, could tolerate my quirks and accept my uniqueness. Donna came from the same background as me and was used to living a modest life. She didn't embrace it as I did, but she could tolerate it. The longer we were married, the more she seemed to adapt. I mean, she became less frugal and more ordinary. I didn't like it, but I understood, especially after the girls were born. To avoid seeming too odd, we bought a small practical house and started wearing slightly nicer clothes. Donna occasionally got her hair done and became quite skilled at taking care of herself and doing makeup. We even bought two smartphones from last year's models. When the girls grew up, Donna started working. It was an office job with minimal pay. She needed transportation, so we bought her a small Honda, just like mine. Her salary barely covered the car expenses, lunches, and her new wardrobe. It wasn't much, but I was fine with that. My name is William Smith. It's the most common name a person could have. I work as an assembly worker at a local company that manufactures industrial compressors. The job is quite repetitive, but I enjoy it. The position and the pay suited me. Every now and then, I was offered a promotion, but I turned it down. I never told Donna. My second indulgence was something I kept hidden from my wife. I felt it was wise to save for retirement. Whenever I had the chance, I bought one-ounce gold Krugerrands. I had over 30 of them in the safe in the basement, and I was just getting started down why last indulgence was the 1970 Challenger. My older brother John died while working on an offshore oil rig. He left the Challenger to me in his will. I could afford to maintain it myself, but the insurance premiums were brutal. Donna did well working at Gilbert. She regularly received pay raises and promotions. During her first year, she talked a lot about her job, but then it started to taper off. Now, she rarely mentions anything about work or the people she works with. I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't figure out exactly what. I hope to get a better sense of what was going on tonight. The company gathering was something like a retreat. It was a weekend event. I didn't feel comfortable, even going to it. I had met all her colleagues at one point or another, and I didn't like any of them that we turned off the federal highway in Holbrook, and I finally had a chance to let the Challenger speed up. 
It responded exactly as I expected. Donna was uneasy because of the speed, but she kept quiet. Yes, I was definitely exceeding the speed limit. No, I didn't care. Bill. What's the rush? We've got plenty of time to get there. Why don't you slow down a bit? I'm not in any hurry to get there. You know full well I didn't want to go at all. I'm just using this time to give the engine a good run. The car needs to stretch its legs every now and then. Please, try not to spoil my mood. This weekend is important for my career. Mrs. Simpson said it would be important for you to be here too. Marge Simpson was the wife of the company's president, Glenn Robertson Simpson. Old money and an old business. Why? What do you mean? Why is it important for me to attend this corporate event? I don't understand. Bill, it's necessary for you to fully understand my new role in the company. So that you can give me the support I need to succeed in my job. I still don't get it. I'm sure Mrs. Simpson will be able to explain it to you when we get there. I've always supported you in the past. Why is this any different now? In my new role, there are many unique responsibilities. Marge said that you should be introduced to them gradually, so you can fully grasp them. It might be difficult for you to understand at first, but she assured me that you'll be thrilled. By the time we arrived at the lodge, my adrenaline was through the roof. It didn't take a genius to figure out what Donna was trying to imply. The weekend promised to be interesting. When we arrived, Donna walked into the lodge, leaving me to carry the bags. I felt like I had been put in my place. Hey. Nice wheels, Mr. Smith. What is it? A 70 or 71? That was Toby Wallace, a young employee at the company. Hey, Toby. How are you? It's a 70. Toby introduced me to his wife, Bonnie. They were sitting on the front porch, but it seemed like everyone else was inside. I looked around the parking lot and estimated there were about 16 cars and one old beat-up truck at the far end. We spent the next five minutes talking about the Challenger. What are you doing out here? Why aren't you and Bonnie inside with the others? They're not really our kind of crowd, Mr. Smith. We were hoping to leave earlier, but Mrs. Simpson insisted we stay. We got up early today to help with the setup. All the caterers left about an hour ago. You'll have to explain. What's going on? Something feels off, but I'm not sure what it is. I don't want to upset you, but I think it might have something to do with your wife. Are you staying for the whole weekend? No. That's why I parked my truck on the side of the road, so I wouldn't have to worry about getting out later. With every passing minute, things were getting more interesting. Well, I'd better take this to our room. Let me know before you leave, okay? Of course. Mr. Smith. Be careful. Don't do anything foolish. Fortunately, it was just two small carry-on bags. When I walked into the lodge, Mrs. Simpson caught my eye, smiled, and waved. Donna was waiting for me upstairs, looking a bit irritated that it had taken me so long to come in. Just in time, Bill. We have a few hours to get ready for the evening. Freshen up and put on something presentable. It's going to be a special night, and I want everything to be perfect. If you don't mind, I'm going to take a walk around the house to clear my head. I'll be back in a little while. I noticed a slight smirk appear on my face as I left the room. It was a bit chilly, which made my walk a little more pleasant. As I estimated earlier, there were indeed 16 cars. Mostly Mercedes, a few Jaguars, and a couple of Lexuses. Four of the cars had out-of-state plates. I was a bit puzzled, trying to figure out how someone in my wife's position could possibly fit in with people of this caliber. She, or rather, we, were definitely out of our league. Something didn't feel right. I noticed Toby and Bonnie loading their bags into the truck. I waved at them and walked over for a quick chat. I see Mrs. Simpson decided to let you go. Not exactly. 
We're sort of sneaking out, Toby said. I feel really uncomfortable here, Mr. Smith. Toby thought we should maybe stay, but I talked him out of it, Bonnie quickly added. Could you do me a small favor and stick around until after the evening reception? I'm feeling a bit uneasy too, and I'd appreciate it. I have no idea what's going on, but I don't like it. Great minds think alike, don't they, Bonnie? She blushed slightly at my lame attempt at humor. I think we can manage that. I had a feeling I was going to like Toby. I really dressed up as my wife insisted. Before we headed to the buffet, our hostess took me by the hand and led me to a quiet corner, we're so glad you decided to come tonight to support Donna. This is a big step in her career, and it's important that she has your full backing. The increase in salary and benefits is quite significant, and I'm sure you'll be pleased with it. Sorry to ask, but what exactly are we talking about here? Donna has been a bit vague. Whenever I ask her about it, she usually brushes me off and tells me to wait until the evening. Nothing to worry about, William. I think she just wants to surprise you. You didn't answer my question. There isn't an official title. I think you could simply say she's a personal assistant. I see. Well, the buffet looks great. Thanks for the explanation, Mrs. Simpson. Marge. Please, call me Marge. The next hour or so, I spent sampling everything at the tables. Donna was busy mingling with important people, so Toby, Bonnie, and I had the chance to spend a bit more time together. We were just finishing up when Mrs. Simpson approached us. William, Donna mentioned that you brought your little sports car tonight. I wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind running an errand for us while we have a few drinks. I smiled and nodded. There are three cases of wine at the store in Holbrook. They're already paid for, so all you need to do is pick them up. There shouldn't be any issues, but if anything comes up, just give me a call. Be sure to take your phone with you. I'd be happy to help, Marge. I'll let Donna know and head out. As she walked away, I glanced at Toby. Meet me outside in five minutes. Donna just smiled when I told her that Mrs. Simpson had asked for my help. Her only comment was, don't forget your phone. Funny how both of them were concerned about the same thing. Toby, I need a favor. He grinned as I tossed him the keys to the challenger. Are you serious? Take it to Holbrook and pick up the three cases of wine for Mrs. Simpson. I have a feeling there might be some kind of delay if you catch my drift. Toby smiled and nodded. Here's my phone. Just leave it on the dashboard. If it rings, don't answer it. Whatever you do, don't turn it off. Any questions? How long do you want us to be gone? At least two hours, and top off the gas before heading back to the lodge. Enjoy yourselves. It was a bit chilly outside, but at least I had the foresight to wear a comfortable jacket. Now, all I had to do was wait and watch. From various spots on the back porch, I could see most of the lodge's interior. A thermos of coffee would have been nice, but I hadn't planned that far ahead. I found a comfortable spot where I could peek inside without being seen. Donna seemed to be the center of attention. I still didn't know why, but I had a pretty good idea. She smiled, laughed, and mingled like a movie star. About 20 minutes later, Mrs. Simpson and Donna glanced at Donna's phone. I knew exactly what they were doing, checking my location. Well, thanks to Toby, I was already nearly in Holbrook. They both smiled as Mrs. Simpson raised her hand and started speaking. Unfortunately, I couldn't make out what was being said, but everyone in the room seemed to approve. It sounded like quiet applause. Glenn Robertson Simpson walked over and took Donna's hand. They began ascending the main staircase and then paused. He raised both their hands, as if in a victory salute, and they both laughed. I heard approving murmurs from the room as they continued up the stairs. I still had about an hour and a half before the challenger would be back. I decided to take my time and have some fun. 
I always carried my trusty buck folding knife with me. It was a gift from my daughters about 10 years ago. It had good steel and a sharp edge. I surveyed my target area and decided to start with the cars closest to the lodge. There was no rush. I carefully placed each valve stem cap in my jacket pocket. I didn't want to lose anything or leave a mess on the Simpsons driveway. 16 cars and 64 valve stem caps that I still had nearly an hour left. What to do? What else could I do? Four cars were locked. All the others were open, so I started again with the one closest to the lodge and removed the registration slips. Some were tucked into sun visors, but most were in the glove boxes. I had no idea what I was going to do with them, but I figured they might come in handy someday that I had to wait another half hour for Toby to return. I decided the valve stems on the spare tires needed to be removed too. Since I had access to the cars, I also had access to the trunks. Twenty minutes later, I had another ten valve stem caps. Two cars didn't have spare tires. I know it was petty and childish, but it gave me a small sense of satisfaction. I'm not a big fan of confrontation, so everything I did or planned to do was sneaky and underhanded. I didn't have any issues with my self-esteem, so I didn't feel the need to act tough or heroic. I'd let the alpha males take on that role. Twenty minutes later, the challenger returned. Toby and Bonnie both seemed to have enjoyed the ride. He confirmed that there had been a delay at the store, just as I had expected, and it looked like it had been planned in advance. While they were gone, I hadn't received any calls on my mobile. I turned it off and removed the SIM card. They were eager to get back home. I thanked Toby, wished him well, and strongly advised him to find another job as soon as possible. I'm sure the cases of wine were quite expensive. The issue was easily solved. I just placed all three cases on the lodge's porch. I definitely didn't want them accusing me of stealing anything, the drive home was relaxing. There wasn't much left in the house that was important to me, a few personal papers, my laptop, and my Krugerrands. Initially, I had planned to set the house on fire before leaving, but that would have made Donna look like a martyr. I didn't want that. I was back on the road for two hours. I didn't feel the need to leave a traditional note or the wedding ring. Let her figure it out on her own. I wasn't in a hurry and didn't have a specific destination in mind. I drove for two days. It was Monday morning when I called work to inform them. I asked for my last paycheck to be sent to my parents' house in Carlisle. They weren't happy that I quit without notice. I apologized but didn't offer any explanation. You can always count on a good breakfast at a diner. Along the way, I picked up a local classified paper and found an interesting ad for a night stalker position at a nearby supermarket. They were looking for someone to stock shelves from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. After breakfast, I stopped by the supermarket. It was in an eclectic old neighborhood in Chattanooga. I spent the next hour driving around the area. There were a lot of old craftsman cottages and a few mobile homes nearby. I could have been content in a small trailer, but I hoped for something a bit nicer. Then, I stumbled upon a sign offering an apartment for rent above a garage. I wasn't interested in the supermarket job just yet, but I didn't want to lose the garage apartment. The garage wasn't included in the rent, but when I offered $50 more per month, they agreed. It was a small apartment with one bedroom and a half bath. There was some basic furniture, a bed, a dresser, a table, and chairs. The rent was reasonable, and the location was convenient, so I took it. I would deal with the bathroom issue later. At least I had a home for the challenger. The situation at the supermarket was a bit different. They had plenty of applicants, but not enough to feel comfortable leaving them alone in the store overnight. I explained my situation to the owner and didn't hold back. The decision to hire me was made when I offered to work behind closed doors, with no benefits, and for a dollar less than they were planning to pay. They didn't even ask for my social security number. I was happy, and they were satisfied. It was only a ten-minute walk from the apartment. 
I spent the rest of the day settling into my new place. The landlord gave me the access code to his internet, which I thought was a nice touch. After a quick trip to the local mall, I had some kitchen supplies and a small microwave. I also bought bedding and cleaning products. That night, I cancelled my life insurance policies. I decided not to bother with bank accounts or credit cards. What harm could it do to her? Both of our daughters were married now. That made my leaving a bit easier. No grandchildren yet, but I'm sure that won't be the case for long that I called my daughter Lara to let her know I was fine. I asked her to be ready to help her mother if necessary. Lara knew I had left, but Donna hadn't given her any other information. She promised to let her sister Linda know. I deleted all calls from my wife and turned off the phone again that I needed a shower. Maybe tomorrow. Not everything was perfect. I needed to find a secure place for my gold. I knew what I had wasn't considered significant by most, but it mattered to me. For some odd reason, I ended up getting a safety deposit box in Huntsville, Alabama. I hoped they wouldn't be able to trace it back to me in Chattanooga. Of course, I was completely wrong, but at least I felt like I tried. It was almost a two-hour drive, but I didn't mind. The garage door at the apartment was fairly secure, but I installed a new latch and a heavy-duty lock just to be sure. I had to protect my C.A.R. that IT didn't take me long to settle into the new job. For the first three evenings, I worked with another man, and then they left me on my own. I didn't need to deal with anything in the grocery or meat departments. The biggest challenge was the frozen food section. After the first two weeks, I had everything under control. For $20 up front and $10 a month, I got a gym membership, which solved my shower problem. The downside was that I had to give them a credit card number. This led to another trip to Huntsville to get a credit card from my new bank. I was starting to realize how hard it was to completely disconnect from the system. Some adjustments were necessary. I had no idea how hard Donna might try to find me or if she would even try at all. To hell with it. I'd deal with that problem if it ever came up. In no time, I fell into a routine. I started work at 10 p.m. and finished at 6. It was a 20-minute jog or a 30-minute walk to the gym. Initially, I joined mostly just for the shower, but over time I started using the other equipment as well. By the end of the first month, I was working out at the gym for nearly two hours every day. I was feeling better and even losing some weight. I had never considered myself heavy, but I was a bit out of shape. It was nice to get back into a routine. I felt comfortable in my new job, and I enjoyed it. It was repetitive, but at the same time, different. It's hard to explain, but I'm sure you know what I mean. I did my job, and they left me alone. The gym was also a good choice. In no time, I figured out which exercises I liked and which ones to avoid. I found that I didn't get any enjoyment from lifting heavy weights. Since I jogged to the gym every day, I wasn't interested in the treadmills. I started each day with a circuit workout, which took about 30 minutes. Then, I spent 20 minutes on the rowing machine, 20 minutes on the stepper, and finished with 20 minutes on the upright bike. I never got around to getting a TV, but I did buy a used desktop computer with a decent-sized monitor. My daily entertainment mostly consisted of watching YouTube videos. I rarely cooked, but I noticed my eating habits were changing a bit. Although it wasn't intentional, I found myself leaning toward a keto diet. Combined with my irregular work hours, I realized I was also doing a bit of intermittent fasting. After three months, I was feeling better and had lost some weight. It was time to call my daughters again. This time, I called Linda. Hey. Linda, it's your dad. Well, it's about time. We've all been worried about you. Are you okay? Yes. I'm doing great. Don't worry about me. I've always been able to take care of myself. I'm just calling to make sure your mom is doing okay. Mom's fine. Looks like she got a promotion at work and loves her job. 
However, she's really mad at you. She said you abandoned her during her promotion celebration and then left the house like a hurt little boy. Those are her words. She said you were jealous of her success. Well, I'm sorry, but I have nothing to add to that. Until she's ready to tell you the truth, that's all I've got. She said that things have been a little tight without your income, but with the promotion, she's managing. Well, I'm glad for her. Did she tell you anything about her new job? Just that she's making more money and gets to travel a lot. I didn't respond. After a brief pause, Linda spoke again. Are you coming home for Christmas? I don't think so. I'll try to send something for you and Lara. We don't need or want anything, Dad. We'd rather have you here. Sorry about that. I've got to go. Say, hi, to Lara for me. Bye. I was feeling a bit down. It seemed to me that my daughters didn't understand the situation and believed I was the cause of all the problems. I wasn't happy about it, but I didn't feel the need to explain myself. It was clear that my wife had no remorse. I found myself growing a little bitter. From what my daughter said, Donna was doing just fine without me. I still didn't understand why she wanted me to be at home. I finished off my case of black and tan and spent the weekend in a slump. My beer consumption was increasing. Weeks passed, and I found that things were improving. I was doing well at work, and I received a promotion I didn't expect. They gave me complete freedom regarding my responsibilities, and in a very short time, I streamlined and improved the restocking system. I provided a weekly report, which they used to determine inventory levels and reorder intervals. The store's computer system already did this in general, but they seemed to appreciate the manual input. The living conditions were ideal for my situation and well within my budget. My weight had dropped, and I was starting to build muscle. With the right lighting, I could even make out a six-pack on my stomach. I stopped shaving, and now I had a thick head of hair, long enough to tie into a small ponytail. My whole appearance seemed to change, and I came across as a bit intimidating. My workouts at the gym were getting easier and a bit longer. An unexpected side effect was that I made a few acquaintances at the gym. They weren't really friends, more like people I knew. I was very careful around the gym's female regulars because I didn't want any trouble with inappropriate behavior. With the guys, it didn't matter, we regularly joked around with each other. However, one unusual connection did form. Her name was Harry, or at least that's what everyone called her. She wasn't very friendly and rarely spoke to anyone. I was the exception. She showed up every morning and consistently worked out for at least two hours. It was an intense workout, not some fancy yoga routine. I guessed she was around 45 or so. She looked tough and always wore sweatpants and a hoodie. The other women flaunted their bodies in tight latex and revealing outfits. But not Harry. I got teased quite a bit because I was the only guy in the gym she would talk to or even look at. I didn't encourage her, but I didn't push her away either. Honestly, I was a little flattered, several months passed, and I hadn't reached out to my daughters or my wife. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I made a few trips to Huntsville to add to my collection of Krugerans. Then everything started to change. William. Can I talk to you for a minute? This wasn't the usual way Harry started a conversation. She called me, William, while all the guys used, Bill. Come to think of it, she had never used my name before. Of course. No problem. Can I help you with something? As a matter of fact, yes. We both sat on a bench and made ourselves comfortable. I have a corporate event I'm supposed to attend on Friday night, and I need an escort. I'll cover all the expenses, and all I need is for you to come with me. I noticed you don't drive, so I'll also take care of transportation. If necessary, I can reimburse you for any costs. I hesitated, and she quickly picked up on it. Did I say or do something wrong? No. Not at all. 
It's just that, well, I've got a few skeletons in my closet. If you can work around them, I'd be happy to help you. All right. What's the issue? Well, for starters, I'm married. Oh. Wow. You never mentioned a wife. I guess that's the main thing. No, not really. I just thought you should know up front. I haven't seen or spoken to my wife in over nine months. I'm not even sure if I'm still married. Have you filed for divorce or separation? No. What's the next problem? I don't have anything appropriate to wear. No suit, no jacket, no dress shirts, no formal shoes. I just don't use any of that, so I don't have it. No problem. I can take care of that. That's why I'm asking a week in advance. I work nights, but I think I can manage to rest up in the evening. I'm glad we're working through this, she said with a smile. What else? Do you want me to shave? William, I like your beard and your hair, but honestly, you're a bit scruffy. Would you mind if my stylist took a look at you on Friday afternoon? Stylist? She smiled as I groaned and nodded that it was fine. This is how my relationship began with Harry, professionally known as Harriet Parker, an attorney. On Tuesday, I found myself at Joss 8 Banks. It's not exactly a high-end store, but definitely a step up from anywhere I'd ever been. Harry had arranged my visit in advance. I ended up with two pairs of trousers and two sports jackets. They added a couple of shirts and some ties to complete the look. I took the extra effort to add two mandarin collar shirts to the pile. I'd always liked them and thought they'd look good with the sports jackets. Harry had paid for everything ahead of time. On my way home, I picked up a new pair of decent shoes and some underwear. I needed new underwear due to my recent weight loss. The shoes were loafers, but still stylish.my visit to the stylist on Friday went well. The guy who worked on me was easygoing and did a great job. He left me with a short, neatly trimmed beard and turned my ponytail into a kind of short, modified braid. I'm not sure of the exact term, but it had a longer tail at the end. He assured me it would be much easier to maintain. I liked it. He didn't talk much about Harry, but he did say I was lucky. Harry arrived at the apartment right at six. She didn't get out of the car but gave a quick honk. The Lexus looked out of place in my neighborhood. I chose a gray jacket and a gray turtleneck. I thought I looked pretty good, but I didn't have much to compare it to. I was grateful she was driving because I wasn't very familiar with the city. Harry, before we go, could you explain exactly what I'm supposed to do or not do tonight? The first hour or so will probably be spent mingling. You don't have to get involved in all of that. Most of the people there will be pretentious snobs that you won't want to deal with. Avoid them if you can. The main thing is, I want you to stick close to me and keep other women away. Try not to stand out, but don't let anyone elbow you around either. Make sure I always have a drink in my hand, ginger ale or mineral water. Be friendly and agreeable, and whatever you do, don't lose your cool. Essentially, you're eye candy. Make them think we're a couple. I've never really thought of myself as that kind of guy. I don't have much experience with things like this. Can you handle it? Of course. Uh, will there be any food? About an hour in, we'll each get a $500 plate of rubber chicken and listen to a few speeches. Once that's done, there'll be some gift giving. Oh, by the way, you look good. That was the moment I realized I hadn't complimented her dress or hairstyle. I was definitely out of my element. The first part of the evening went exactly as she explained. I found that my role was actually a bit easier than I expected. The room was full of single men, all dressed in expensive suits and wearing large watches. Harry looked really good, and most of them knew she wasn't married. Quite a few took the time to come over and chat with her a bit, testing the waters, so to speak. I caught myself squinting at them like Charles Bronson. Surprisingly, it worked. 
Every time I stepped back to refresh her drink, another vulture would fly up to her. A few guys brought her drinks, which she quietly handed to me to dispose of. Harry glanced at me a couple of times and sort of smiled. Sort of. Finally, we got to sit down. Three hundred chicken dinners appeared out of nowhere. The plate of food was pathetic. I wouldn't call myself a picky eater, but this was something else. I kept thinking about the five hundred dollars. Harry leaned toward me a bit. William. Want to tear this place apart? She tried to do a Bogart impression, but it didn't quite land. I didn't respond. I just stood up, took her hand, and we quietly left. I don't think anyone even noticed. When we pulled into the garage, she kicked off her shoes and tossed me the keys to the Lexus. Find us some real food, William. Twenty minutes later, we were at Willie's Country. We each had a full plate and a bottle of beer. She was familiar with Tabasco. We both ignored the fries. The bibs were happily accepted. While we ate, I noticed something unusual, her evening dress had long sleeves. Most women's dresses had short sleeves or none at all. She was also still barefoot, and it didn't seem to bother her at all. Things quickly went back to normal. My evening with Harry was pleasant, though it didn't end in any intimacy. We continued our usual routine at the gym. Three weeks later, Harry had another event that required an escort. Naturally, I agreed. I felt obligated to explain the situation to my boss, and he found it pretty amusing. Given the circumstances, he told me I didn't need to ask for time off, just to leave him a note. He more or less told me that I was responsible for managing my own time. Harry's daily workouts at the gym were pretty intense. Her heart rate was up, and she sweat quite a bit. She was always fully dressed. Most of the women at the gym wore sports bras and shorts. Harry wore hoodies and long pants. It didn't seem to make sense, but I wasn't about to bring it up. Our second evening was similar to the first, except there was no food and more drinking. More drinks meant more guys hovering around. Every other guy who approached her brought a fresh drink. I spent most of the evening collecting and disposing of unwanted glasses. One of the more persistent guys finally got on my nerves. I pulled him aside and quietly told him that if he bothered my fiancé again, I'd clean his clock. He disappeared for the rest of the evening, as did several other pests. I didn't realize I'd become so intimidating, after the event, we went for sushi, but ended up having $40 worth of sashimi. It was another fun, platonic evening point two days later, Harry surprised me while I was on the rowing machine. Why didn't you tell me we're engaged? I was a bit confused yesterday when some of my co-workers asked me about it. She didn't wait for an answer but smiled. I called Lara. She said that Donna had been avoiding her and Linda. All Lara knew was that Donna was traveling a lot and that people were regularly staying over at her house. I asked if her mother had filed for divorce, and she had no idea. It had been several weeks since she and Linda last spoke with her. For some reason, I got angry. The more bottles I emptied, the worse it got. The next morning, I picked up one of those flat rate boxes from the post office and sent 74 valve stems to Glenn Simpson at Gilbert Company. I attached a short note, thanks for the fun evening. It had been more than a year since the party, but I was pretty sure he'd remember it. I skipped the gym that day. I didn't feel like working out with a hangover. The following day, Harry really gave me the third degree. I promised I'd explain everything the next time we had dinner together. She picked me up at six. Harry took me to a steakhouse. It was my first time at a place like that. I dressed up nicely for her. She listened calmly and didn't pass judgment the entire evening. I got back to my apartment just in time for the start of my work shift. The next day at the gym, Harry had another question for me. Do I know anyone who was at the lodge that night? When I told her I had the names and addresses of everyone who was there, her eyes lit up. 
After our workout, she came over to my place, and I handed her an envelope with 12 vehicle registration documents. She grabbed them and kissed me on the cheek. There are 15 types of lawyers. Harry was a scandal lawyer. She tried to explain it to me, but I just smiled and asked how much this was going to cost me. All I got in response was another kiss on the cheek. Three days later, my daughter Linda called me. Donna had called her, asking if she knew where I was. There was some trouble at Donna's workplace, and she was at the center of it. She was upset and wanted to talk to me immediately. Linda refused to tell her anything. I wondered if Glenn had received those valve stems. I called Harry and told her I'd pick her up in 20 minutes. Her office was in an upscale shopping center. It was nice, but not too flashy. Harry had never seen the Challenger before. The topic of my car ownership had never come up. The sound of the engine preceded my arrival, and it brought a few curious onlookers from her office as she came outside. I walked around to open her door and smiled at the gawkers. Harry laughed as she got into the car. Well played, William. Well played. I suppose you'll want an engagement ring now. All in good time. No need to rush. I kept the Challenger under control until we crossed the Tennessee River. Then I started letting her open up a bit. Highway 72, heading to Huntsville, is a nice stretch of road, but not the best place to show off. We sat at Dreamland for two hours. William, everyone who was at the lodge that night has been served. What do you mean? It's a lawsuit. The legal term is intentional infliction of emotional distress, contributing to the destruction of a marriage. Is that really a thing? It looks like all the necessary categories have been met. Their behavior was intentional, it was extreme, and it caused you significant emotional distress. That must be why my wife was upset. By that time, each of us had a plate of ribs in front of us. The conversation slowed down a bit, Harry had just finished gnawing on the last rib when she looked up. What do you mean your wife was upset? My daughter Linda called me today and said Donna needed to talk to me. There's a big problem at work, and somehow, she's caught up in it. That's all I know. Glenn Simpson and Gilbert Company are facing a million-dollar lawsuit. The other 11 people are being sued for 100000 each. I'm not trying to be a smart guy, but do you think this will work? Of course. It might not be as straightforward as it seems, but I think some interesting things could happen. I wanted another bottle of beer, but I couldn't risk it because of the long drive home. Harry could take the risk, though, and she enjoyed the moment as she sipped her beer with a bit of smug satisfaction. I felt a bit excited as we were leaving the restaurant, so I casually asked Harry if she'd like to get a room and head back in the morning. I'd love to, but I can't. We could leave early if you want. It's not about that. Let's just head back now. I'll explain on the way home. The first 20 minutes in the car were quiet, and then she started to open up. It turns out that eight years ago, Harry weighed almost 150 kilograms. She decided to go on a diet and start exercising instead of opting for gastric bypass surgery. She lost 70 kilograms. Unfortunately, she was left with about 10 kilograms of loose skin. It took five surgeries to remove the excess skin, and now she had scars all over her body. Harry, being brave and honest, admitted that she was very self-conscious about her scars. She had avoided dating and any contact with male friends. For some reason, she felt comfortable around me but didn't know why. I dropped her off at her house, walked her to the door, and gave her a light kiss on the cheek. She thanked me for dinner, and as I left, I noticed a small tear in her eye that we continued our platonic dates. It seemed to work well for both of us. My supermarket appeared to be quite popular with the locals. In less than two years, they had opened two more stores and were scouting for new locations. The owners were serious when they offered me a full-time position as the inventory manager for all three branches. 
However, they insisted that I become a permanent employee, which meant I had to go fully legit. At this point, it didn't seem to matter anymore, so I agreed. Harry was happy, so I was happy too. A few more weeks passed. I hadn't heard from my daughters in a while, then I got a short text on my phone, mom got fired. This complicated things a bit. Now I had a steady job with a decent salary, and Donna was out of work. At that moment, I feared I might eventually get dragged into a divorce. Then things got even worse. William, for a change, I have some good news. Harry was serious, and I was all ears. Three of the eleven people we sued have settled. What does that mean? Since we filed for just a hundred thousand dollars, their insurance companies advised them to go ahead and pay it to avoid any public court proceedings. It was covered by their insurance, so it wasn't a big personal loss for them. You mean we could actually make some money out of this? William. I've already received three checks. There might be more. Do you think this has anything to do with Donna's firing? I'm almost certain it does. Will this mess up my divorce? Have you filed yet? No. Not yet. I was going to ask you to help me with that. Harry gave me a genuinely wide smile. William, pack a small bag and get the challenger ready. We're going on a trip to see your wife. We'll leave early Thursday morning. Now I was smiling too. We left at 6 in the morning and checked into the Sheraton Hotel 10 hours later. The challenger was happy. I called Linda and asked her to invite Donna and Lara to lunch at the Reading Motor in the next day. The dinner conversation was a bit awkward. Choosing from the Red Lobster menu was fun, and we ended up spending more than we had planned. We didn't mind, though, as it felt like a bit of a celebration. Our conversation was varied and somewhat confusing. Why? We were both carefully avoiding the elephant in the room. We were spending our first night together. We'd been friends with no benefits for over a year. The last thing I wanted was to make her feel uncomfortable. Although I won't go into the details of that evening, I will say that it wasn't nearly as nerve-wracking as we had expected. We were both a little out of our element, but we managed to get through it with the expected results. She seemed relieved that I wasn't repelled, and I was happy that it wasn't nearly as bad as she had led me to believe. We were a pair of happy fools. In the morning, we had a late breakfast. Donna and the girls were waiting at the table when we arrived. I was wearing one of my new sports coats with a dark turtleneck. I looked good. Harry wore one of her lighter business suits, something casual yet professional. My wife and daughters looked at me in amazement. Donna, Linda, Lara. This is Harriet Parker, my trusted confidant and attorney. Harriet, this is my wife, Donna, and my daughters, Linda and Lara. It was awkward, but it was the best I could do. Before we could get into any pointless small talk, the waiter arrived to take our drink orders. I'm not hungry. If you don't mind, I'll just have coffee, Donna broke the silence first. I quickly glanced around the table and came to the same conclusion. Why don't you just bring us five cups of coffee and leave the pot on the table? The waiter nodded, and everyone seemed to breathe a sigh of relief at this decision. It's nice to see you again, Bill. Would you mind telling us what you've been up to lately? Donna gave a slight smirk as she said this. Just working and giving you the freedom to find yourself or whatever it is you've been doing. Harry gently nudged me under the table. You were supposed to be there for me, and you abandoned me. Maybe you needed someone, but it wasn't me. Mom. Dad. Stop this. I'm sure you didn't organize this meeting just to throw jabs at each other. Dad. Why are we here? Linda was firm. I could tell this was going to be a very short meeting. I felt lost. I looked at Harry for any clue on how to proceed. She ignored me but took control of the conversation. Harry reached into her purse and pulled out an envelope. She slid it across the table to Donna. Mrs. Smith, this is a divorce settlement. 
I think you'll find it very fair. I suggest you take it to your lawyer and have them review it. Both Lara and Linda looked shocked. It was easy to see they hadn't expected this. However, Donna had a wide smile on her face. She didn't take the envelope from Harry but instead reached under the table and pulled out an identical one from her purse. You idiot. I divorced your sorry ass eight months ago for desertion, you never got the papers because I didn't know where to send them. It's final. Whatever you've got here doesn't matter. You don't have anything I want anyway. Her smile turned into a wide smirk. The waiter returned with our coffee and a full pot for the table just as Donna stood up. She smiled at Harry and me, and gave the girls a strange look before leaving. She left both envelopes on the table. Dad, can we all stay for lunch? I've heard they have really good custard pie here, Lara said. Harry and I chuckled, and we asked the waiter to bring menus. Harry, Lara, and Linda enjoyed a great lunch and conversation. I felt like I was eating alone. I've never really understood women well. The girls exchanged phone numbers and promised to stay in touch. Back at the hotel room, I started packing. William, I thought we were staying another night. We'll stay overnight, just not here. Hurry and pack your things. An hour and thirty minutes later, we were in Elkton, Maryland. Thirty minutes after that, Harriet Parker became Harry Smith. We spent the night in Luray, Virginia. I wanted to drive further, but we couldn't. We now have a house with a three-car garage. That's another story, the girls told me Donna had a fit when she found out I got two million dollars from the Gilbert Company. Donna moved to Iowa. I don't know why. Thank you for listening until the end. See you in the next episode of Cheating Secrets. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. Goodbye.